Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Wheeler Centre. I'm Sally Warhaft. Tonight we have a star-spangled Fifth Estate brought to you in partnership with Blueprint for Free Speech and the Centre for Advancing Journalism. And uh, our guests tonight know all about what really happens when you blow the whistle on a government agency and why it matters. Our guests now devote their working lives to supporting other whistleblowers and uh, have come to us all the way from the land of the free and the brave. <laughs> Jessalyn Raddick is uh, a lawyer for Edward Snowden and the Director of National Security and Human Rights at the Government Accountability Project. And this is the most prominent whistleblowing support NGO in the United States. She was an ethics advisor to the United States government, uh, Department of Justice, where she herself became a whistleblower after discovering the FBI were violating their ethical standards and the Department of Justice had tried to cover it up. Thomas Drake is a former senior executive and technical director for software engineering at the National Security Agency, the NSA. He blew the whistle on massive multi-billion dollar fraud, waste and abuse at the agency and secret surveillance programs after 9-11. He now works at an Apple shop in Maryland. Please welcome our very special guests. Jessalyn, I'll, I'll start with you. You've said that all whistleblowers underestimate the sheer force of the executive branch raining down on you. All endure a cavernous loneliness, this weird netherworld, very lonely and isolated. And when you are charged with the Espionage Act, as Snowden has been, you are radioactive. Tell us about how Edward Snowden is doing. You've visited him new, numerous times. You've been to Russia. How is he doing and, and what is he doing and how has this affected him? He is actually doing remarkably well for someone in these circumstances. He is one of the most well-grounded, centered, funny, thoughtful and introspective men I've ever met, and for him to be able to have gone through this and come out the other side and still be quite intact, um, it, it speaks to his solidity. Um, I think he's keeping busy doing a lot of testimony around the world to different governments who want to hear from him. He tries to be very actively engaged in the reform process, and. He sits on the board of an American organization called Freedom of the Press Foundation. That's something that's of grave concern to him, is the treatment, protection of whistleblowers, and protection of sources, and the ability to have a free press. So um, I think he keeps himself quite busy. Uh, he is used to living on the computer for long periods of time. And for him, and a lot of people, that really opens up an entire world, even when your day-to-day -day circumstances may be a bit constrained. He described his life as that of an indoor cat, but it didn't actually sound that different to the life he'd led before in, in that respect. Thomas, uh, tell us a little bit about how um, being a, a whistleblower affected your life. Well, it completely upends it. I mean, it's, you end up separating yourself out from an institution, you end up... Um, leaving an entire social network of colleagues uh, and friends, um, and in my case, uh, an entire career in the government. To a, an Apple store in Maryland, because you said nobody else will employ you now. Unfortunately, uh, as a whistleblower, particularly in the national security arena, and particularly since 9-11, um, since you are considered radioactive. Um, you become an untouchable in terms of any other government employment or any companies that have worked with the government. And even other companies are uh, very reluctant to hire a whistleblower mm. because you, know, you might blow the whistle on them. 
The, the data collection of the NSA and GCHQ in Britain um, has been and is an, an abuse of power on a, a massive scale. But many of the consequences of this have been unpredictable. And I, I'd like the two of you to, I suppose, get into it, to, to describing to us what some of the consequences have been that, that have not been so obvious. I mean, to me, one consequence that has been under the radar for a lot of people, though the government seems attuned to it, is that whether or not reform happens legislatively or judicially in terms of mass bulk surveillance, people, technologists, are taking precautions. And far more people are encrypting their communications. Um, and the people who are making the ability to do so are making encryption much more widely available and user-friendly. And newsrooms have created secure drop whereby people can disclose safely and anonymously. Um, and I know as a lawyer, and I, I, I must use encryption in order to represent the national security and intelligence clientele. Um, that I do, and I also know that most journalists I won't deal with if they're not encrypted, and most of them are using at least a basic form of encryption. I think that's something that's been a bit under the radar um, to a lot of the people who are hand-wringing in Congress about whether or not their bill was, will be stripped or go through. Well, the, I mean, Edward Snowden says, too, this is his drive now, isn't it, to, to, to try and work out new methods of encryption and so on. But I, w I would have thought that wherever you can have somebody that can create encryption, you can have somebody else that can bust it. You, you're in a cyber arms race, uh, especially at the nation state level and other entities. Uh, there's no question that even NSA considers anybody using encryption to be suspicious by virtue of using it because that means they must be hiding something. And if they're hiding something, then they want to know about it. Uh, I do have colleagues who don't use any encryption, and the reason they don't is it doesn't matter to them. Um, and these are people that actually used to work there. Um, but I think there's, there's a bigger thing at stake here, and it's ultimately uh, beyond protecting and, and due diligence and sensitive communications and keeping uh, the government from invading it uh, wherever possible. Um, I understand all that, but information in the digital age has become the currency of power. And the government wants to control it. And they want to particularly control information about itself. And so you have this irony of the, of the, of the modern digital era where we have extraordinary amounts of data being generated by virtue of the technologies that we, we now use and enjoy. But you also have governments and corporations who recognize that that information is unique and has, has extraordinary value. If you're a secret government agency, uh, you get to know an awful lot about people, about citizens. And history is not kind, because the tendency is you want to know even more. And so you end up getting addicted to the data. If you're a corporation, you want to sell as many products and services as possible uh, to your subscribers. So it's a very rich environment for that. The question becomes, whose data is it? And it's a fundamental question, because the government will argue, as they do in the United States, that it's not really your data, particularly the metadata. You have no reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, it's, ours, it's ours to get uh, through various means. If I'm a corporation, then you have terms and conditions in which uh, you ba basically cede ownership of that data for their own use. Well, you talk about this individual sovereignty, and is what you mean by that that each individual has a right to own it? Is that even possible? In, I believe in it is world. possible because, I mean, this is what I think is disappearing in the modern, modern age is what is individual sovereignty? What, what is the essence of what it means to be a human being? And is it simply the collection or the sum of all of your electronic transactions? We're far more than that as, as human beings. And yet this is the fragmentation of our own, our own social, uh, our own social structure. And then it gets reassembled. You know, corporations sell it back to us, and you know, in governments uh, get to find out about us. So it's, I think there's a fundamental question uh, regarding sovereignty. And you have this inversion. This, the pyramid has been inverted, meaning that it was much easier in the old days, I say the analog days, or the analog era of, of, of information, uh, to essentially protect who you were. 
And now, because of the sheer amount of data that's, that circumscribes our lives through various means and, and held by uh, other entities and corporations and data brokers, well, then they get to use it for other purposes. And, you know, it's, it's, it's the challenge we face. And I've given my own experience and given what I know the surveillance regimes for them, there is no sovereignty. The sovereignty is what they can get away with because it's, it's power. And we sometimes forget that that's what's at stake here. Um, and we're dealing, we're dealing with real power. We're dealing with elites. We're dealing with power structures that are in government. We're dealing with power structures that are held by corporations. And this, this kind of power does not yield, yield willingly. Edward Snowden wrestled with what he did and before he did it. Uh, in fact, he delayed doing it because he thought that President Obama might uh, be more liberal, I suppose. In, keep his promises. Uh, keeping, yes, keeping, <laughs> keeping his promises. Um, but he did wrestle with it and he, he has expressed many times that you know, there is a need for security, there is a need for information to be gathered. How much... And, and how should it be done if, if um, uh, we assume that we're at, back even in the, in the day when uh, it was uh, mail in a letterbox, uh, there was always surveillance in nation states. How much should there well, be? Snowden, I think, has been very clear about how he feels about this, which reflects a constitutional standard in America under the Fourth Amendment um, governing illegal search and seizure, and that you don't get to seize people's data unless you have probable cause to believe that they're committing a crime. Now, even when you water that down to having only a reasonable suspicion, even that has been dispensed with. There is no threshold right now for gathering data. It's completely indiscriminate, and therefore the NSA has been da gathering data on hundreds of millions of innocent people in the U.S. and all over the world. Um, so I think he and a lot of other reformers would like to see a return to the constitutional standard and the first commandment that NSA used to follow, which was, thou shalt not spy on Americans, um, according to our Constitution. Um, so I think that's where he would come out on that. I think there's, a, there's another issue, though. The opportunity costs uh, for the government was much higher. Um, technology has actually brought the cost of accessing information, even storing it, essentially to zero. Um, so it's extraordinarily tempting when I can access vast reams of information. In the past, I had to work at it. Uh, even traditional means by which I would actually surveil someone electronically, there was an opportunity cost. I had to dedicate personnel. I had to dedicate time. I had to de dedicate money. Now, geez, I mean, I just I either access it, hack into it as a nation state, or I got cooperating agreements with telcos and, and ISPs. Uh, you actually get lazy in terms of traditional law enforcement. You get lazy in terms of going after real threats because now you're essentially collecting everything just in case which means it's even harder to find the real threats in the data. And somehow it's the data where we're going to find it. And then we don't have enough people, so we're going to use algorithms. We're going to use signatures. Well, that's one of the ironies in this whole story with Snowden is that you've got uh, the NSA, with all that they collected, are still clueless about what exactly he took and who has it. Uh, which is, uh, I mean, that, that makes me wonder just how competent the NSA uh, I mean, it took them 48 hours to work out that it was Snowden who'd done it, which it was quite a long time, given the manpower, I imagine, they had uh, on to that. How, how good do you think the NSA are at actually using or manipulating or, or, or either for good or ill, this information. They're but, not, because that's, you, don't, you don't create a multi-billion dollar storage facility out in Utah, right? Uh, if, if you're having problems figuring it out, then your solution is to just collect it. And this is precisely what I was confronted by after 9-11. This is the, the specter that I faced was the United States had unchained itself from the Constitution 
It was now under emergency decree, and it said, we just want the data. I was actually told that by the lead attorney at NSA. You don't understand, Tom. We just need the data, as if that was the answer, because there had been this systemic failure called 9-11, and so their answer was, let's just access everything, no yeah. matter where it was located, no matter who held it, no matter who, who kept it. We just need the data, as if that was going to be the answer. Uh, so the bill, the, the NSA knew, I mean, it's really, it's really, I mean, it's still surreal for me. You know, here I am in Australia before you all. NSA knew that they had a huge challenge problem in the 1990s. They were woefully behind the times, and they could see that they were increasingly going, going deaf because more and more of the world's communications was going to fiber optic and, and other digital, uh, digital networks. And so their traditional apparatus, their traditional structure was increasingly challenged to, to, to deal with it. And so the, the challenge problem was, even if you collect all this, because NSA fundamentally is a technical collection agency, how do I make sense of it all? That, that challenge was actually met by the very best of American ingenuity innovation during the 90s. And I became part of that solution. But it was all rejected because NSA, in its infinite wisdom, decided the problem is so big that we need big programs and big dollars. And so they launched a multi-billion dollar um, program called Trailblazer that was going to catapult them into the 21st century, as if more money uh, was actually going to solve the problem. So it's how ironic is it that a very technical agency actually had the solution in hand and rejected it in favor of outsourcing it to contractors to solve something that had already been Solved. But the other irony here, I think, is if you're looking for a needle in a haystack, why do you keep making the haystack bigger? <laughs> and by NSA's own admission, despite all of this massive data gathering that's been going on over the last decade, um, well, initially they said it thwarted 54 terrorist plots. The director of NSA testified about that. And later he had to revise what he said, and admitted that it had really thwarted maybe one terrorist plot that could have been thwarted by regular law enforcement um, means. And if you look at the most recent, I mean, the Boston bombing that occurred in the US and the recent downing of the Malaysian airliner, despite all the surveillance, th they were unable, no government was able to detect or prevent those tragedies. In other words, it doesn't work, but we're still doing it, which to me speaks to something larger and scarier, which is about population control. Although they, of course, would counter by saying you don't know. It's not news if it didn't happen, and they, they would obviously say that they've prevented uh, how, how many attacks. I guess the problem is we don't know. Well, they said they, pre they prevented 54, but then, again, that he... The director, uh, Alexander, who directed the NSA, had to fess up that that was a lie, that really there was one terror plot they knew of that they had actually prevented through their surveillance. So really, they don't have a good record here. And even, you know, you don't have to believe me, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, as well as the White House's own hand-picked internal review panel, both found that the mass bulk surveillance was ineffective and likely unconstitutional. Look, it's, it's I, again, it's just, there's, you know, having lived there and seen what happened, right, and the mindset of, it's a technical agency, we need to know it all. So we're now addicted in the digital age, there's so much data in, I'm pipelining, I'm mainlining the data. I just continue to get hooked on it because there's always new data being generated. The problem in, in, this, in, in the context of this mindset is if you're creating a bigger and bigger haystack, that makes every straw a needle, which means now I can't find the needles because every straw is a potential needle. So now I actually make the problem worse. So you, the argument that somehow we need more data to find the threats actually is, contradicts itself. You've actually become extraordinarily lazy because now you're just piling data upon data upon data. I used to see what would happen with analysts in this mindset, where they would spend hours and hours doing queries against terabytes and terabytes of data, waiting hours and hours for the returns to come. And then they would keep saving what they would return because it would take too long to go out and query the database again. And there's still more data coming in. It doesn't end. 
So now you're spending more time just processing data and storing data and accessing data. And you sort of forget what your fundamental mission was. It's not about intelligence anymore. It's just about collecting it all and accessing it all. And they became absolutely obsessed. And if there's anything that Edward Snowden showed, it shows how far in what I call this obsessive compulsion, just hoarding complex, just to, to keep and store it all, how far they went with all these programs with various partners and other security services in other countries, just in case they might miss something. So if you're obsessed with trying to find everything you're missing, then guess what? You're going to be missing a whole lot. How, how then do you, you know, do we debate this? How do we define what the perimeters of this debate should be? I mean, we've got, uh, we know at the moment through presumably very fine intelligence in Australia that there are um, uh, numerous uh, young Australians fighting uh, over in Syria and Iraq. Um, I, as a citizen, uh, absolutely expect my government to be onto that, uh, to be knowing what they're bringing back, what they're up to. How do you, how do you find that balance between what is safe and secure and reasonable, um, and what becomes? a great encroachment on everybody's privacy. I think there's a legitimate, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, you think everything should be public, and that's simply not the case. Obviously, there are things that should be secret, troop movements and undercover identities and nuclear design information and what we're planning in Syria right now. Um, there are legitimate secrets, but the problem is when you make everything a secret, which has been a problem with the overclassification, certainly in the US under the Bush administration, and it's only gotten worse under the Obama administration, the more, once everything becomes a secret, nothing's a secret. Yet people continue, there's this culture of secrecy because people feel self-important when they can stamp a document um, classified. But again, I have seen baby announcements and Christmas cards stamped classified. And, and that diminishes the value of real secrets. I think we need to get a grip on what legitimately is a secret. We need to deal with the problem of mass overclassification, particularly in the Five Eyes countries. Um, and certainly, the mass bulk surveillance doesn't seem to be helping. Everyone seems to agree with that, except for President Obama and a couple of people on the intelligence committees in the US. Um, but doing targeted surveillance and doing actual human intelligence, which was p part of the mission of the NSA, getting back to doing that, I think, would be part of the solution. I, I think there's a, there's a more fundamental dilemma we face um, in society. Um, if you want perfect security, you've know, you, you got to give up all liberty and freedom. Um, it's particularly personal for me because during the Cold War, I used to fly on RC-135 reconnaissance aircraft, and the country in which I became an expert was East Germany. East Germany was a police state, was a surveillance state. And I've spoken extensively to people who used to live there. Uh, it's, not, it's not a society you want to live in. It was certain, it was boring, it was monochromatic, um, but if you deviated in the slightest outside of what was carefully described, especially as the decades went on, you would get noticed. If you got noticed, then you'd have people you know, looking at you, and if you got people looking at you, then you got files and records being created, because you might be a threat to the state. I mean, this, this is a fundamental question we have to wrestle with. Are we going to actually eat out the heart of democracy for the sake of security? We're going to lose both. And it is a fundamental tension that we face now, and something has to give. Um, what I was faced with was an anathema form of government. You can't have the equivalent of martial law. You can't have the equivalent of executive fiat rule. That's, you know, if you, ex if you exempt national security from rule of law, then they get to determine what the, what, what the laws are. And those laws, in essence, secret law, ends up being imposed on the rest of the population. We don't have to sacrifice all of our privacy for, for a few people that might want to do, do bad things against us. And in fact, you actually obscure it. And I would actually argue that traditional law enforcement, uh, traditional rules that have existed in terms of, of probable cause and going after those who are committing crimes or maybe involved in crimes, uh, that's what we need to return to. We don't have to end up turning our society inside out just to find every possible threat that exists. In this mindset, everything becomes a threat. 
And that's what's justifying kind of this zero sum game. This is this false dichotomy that we, you know, just in case of the 1%, right, we have to compromise the 99. And of course, all this is happening in, in not just a change of culture in security and information gathering, but a change in culture where we have generation after generation now growing up, putting their privacy out there, uh, you know, putting their lives from very young age. Uh, and I, I wonder if there's a, I mean, I wonder what your sense and what you actually know about public opinion is on these issues and whether people are as, as aware of this as they should be or whether they're kind of softened up to it in, in some way. Certainly a lot of people are putting much more out there because they have the ability to do so and because it's fun or because it allows you to share. Um, I would, I, when you actually look at it, when I actually try to try to uh, hack into my own kids' accounts to, <laughs> to see what they're doing, they actually have more privacy protections than I ever thought they would. Um, and they, they have their public Instagram account, and they have their private one that I, only they and a few of their invited friends can see, and Snapchat, and uh, where the picture dissolves after a few seconds, and things like that. Um, but I think there's a difference between, for example, you know, sometimes Amazon tells me that based on the books I've ordered, here are three other books we think you would like to read. Well, if I'm annoyed by that, I can terminate my relationship with Amazon. I can't terminate my relationship with the government. And additionally, Amazon doesn't have the power to arrest me and put me in jail whereas the US government does. So when the US is doing this sort of um, data gathering on people, it, to me that's very different than when a private corporation is doing it. I mean, certainly there's some dangerous overlap and in terms of the pathology, it, it's the same. But in terms of the power that the corporation has um, ver versus um, the, what the government has, there's a difference. There's two things. You have an economic reality that surveillance is a growth industry. And there's enormous amounts of money being, um, uh, enormous amounts of money being transferred of, into the coffers of a very small, small percentage. But, but it's enormous profits. And because it's a growth industry, they're incentivized to continue to sell uh, the fear and also promote the fear mongering of these existential threats. Um, there's also uh, the reality that increasingly governments want to know more and more about their own citizens. And so they want to buy the equipment that lets them uh, keep track of their citizens for, for social control. Um, History is not kind here. It's, it's, I think it's really critical, uh, once again, to, to focus on if we don't learn the lessons from even the 20, the dark chapters of the 20th century, uh, we're doomed to repeat those uh, in the 21st century and beyond. Here's another reality. When I confront people with this whole meme of privacy, people say privacy's dead, you know, um, you don't understand, Tom, it's now the digital age, it's all different. I say, okay, fine, then you just give me all the keys to, keys to your car, give me the keys to your apartments, to your house, get, turn over all of your email uh, files to me and your passwords and all your medical records and all your credit cards. You know, and I'll and I'll I'll put them in a box, and I'll 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 take care of it you know, for safekeeping. And they say no. Well, I mean, how one, many? One, okay. How many people would do that out there? Yeah, mm -hmm. I've had. I mean, I don't think no one's raising their hand. Yes, I will do that. Right? Why? Why is it that people, when confronted by the stark reality, that they're not willing, as a consenting adult, to give up their keys and their passwords and their accounts and their, quote unquote, the personal information of their lives. And when confronted, they say, well, that's me. That's mine. It's my choice. Really, it's your choice. So you're, willing, you're not willing to give me what you claim is private, what you claim is yours. Even as a consenting adult, you will not consent to that, but you're more than willing to let the government run roughshod over that and have access to it, or let the corporations provide access to it as back doors either or front doors to the government. That's a fundamental contradiction. You really trust your own government to keep your data safe and that they're not going to abuse 
the, the privilege of, of seeing your lives all unfolded uh, before them. Look, they don't know you, dude. They don't have a relationship with you. Um, I mean, I, this is what I was confronted with early on. I realized that the strategic decisions the United States was making in the deepest of secrecy, if they thought that this was such a good thing, then why didn't they go to the public and say, we're doing this on your behalf and let's have a conversation debate about it? At least now, because of the Edward Snow disclosures, we're finally having that debate. We get to choose as people whether or not we want this to occur. But you don't know what you don't know. And so part of the challenge, you know, whistleblowers and truth tellers are really holding up mirrors to ourselves. They're the ones that are the, 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 the canaries in the coal mine. I want to ask you about the role of the media in all of this. It's been um, incredibly important. A lot of it reads like a fantastic sort of thriller movie where you can sort of see Robert Redford playing Alan Rusbridger and smashing up a computer. He was here as a guest at this program um, not so long ago. You can hear it on a podcast if you, if you go to the website. You know, he had his little, he had the little, what do you call it? Uh, thumb drive. The thumb drive, thank you, uh, uh, on his person. Um, now, it was interesting to me that uh, Edward Snowden chose to go to serious traditional media. Uh, the Guardian was involved, the New York Times, the uh, Washington Post, and a very well-known documentary filmmaker from all uh, over the place. Um, how, how did the media do, do you think, in, in all of this? I think the media did great in terms of breaking down the information that he had and being able to reassemble it in bite-sized pieces and in working with technologists for the first time, which they pretty much were forced to do in order to understand exactly what they were seeing. Um, but I think the media did a very responsible job in delivering and is continuing to do a responsible job in delivering this information to the public that's clearly in the public interest and clearly the public has a right to know what is being done in their name in secret um, when it violates privacy of people all over the world. Um, so I think strategically that that was it a very brilliant plan? And people often talk about, well, his disclosures, and he exposed this, and he revealed this. Well, actually not. He said, I don't trust myself to make that judgment, and therefore, I'm going to give this information to journalists. And using their editorial discretion, they can determine what is in the public interest to know and what people have a right to hear about. And every single one of those articles, according to the main journalists who have been breaking these stories, have been run by the various governments um, to give them a chance to make their case for why sh something should not be published. And um, the Washington Post's Barton Gelman, for example, said, there, he couldn't think of an instance where they had actually published something where the government had said, absolutely, please don't do this. So I think the government realized the jig was up um, and that this stuff was going to come out and that there wasn't a real security interest to keep it private. It, it seemed to be a lot more about embarrassment rather than substantial threat. Absolutely. I think if you're a whistleblower, how dare you? I mean, look out. If you embarrass the government, you will get such retaliation. But heaven help you if you expose actual illegality. They will unleash everything on you. And you can see that with Edward Snowden. He has lost his family, his life that he had, his friendships, his, his love, everything he had to leave behind in order to take this tremendous act of civil disobedience so that we could have a conversation. Um, and it's strangely, well, interestingly enough, the classification guidelines say you may not classify information to avoid embarrassment. But that is precisely what has been done on numerous occasions. See, I'm present um, having lived for many years under the boot of the Department of Justice looking to put me away for many, many uh, decades. 
and the reality that the original chief prosecutor threatened me with spending the rest of my life in prison if I didn't cooperate with a government investigation, which I refused to do after that. Um, you know, I, I'm very present that Chelsea Manny is uh, in Fort Leavenworth, 35 year sentence. I'm well aware that Julian Assange is sitting in an Ecuadorian uh, embassy. Um, I'm well aware that Edward Snowden, inspired by me, uh, given what happened to me, is in Russia. Uh, these are the, this is the enormous prices paid uh, to free information up in the public interest. Um, and that's, this is ultimately, the, the information wants to be free, it really does. And um, this is the kind of information that need, people need to know about. Now, on the other hand, you've got a government who's more than willing to criminalize anybody who dares reveal whether it's embarrassing, whether it's a violation of law, whether it's wrongdoing, uh, or whether, whether it's mass surveillance, or torture for that matter. Um, my friend John Kiriakou, uh, also represented by Justin Radak, is currently serving a 30-month uh, prison sentence because he revealed the fact, as a former CIA employee and, and uh, an operative, uh, that the United States engages in worldwide, global, state-sponsored uh, torture regimes. Um, and, you know, I also, uh, I'm free. I mean, I'm here in, in Australia as a free human being. I cannot begin to tell you what that means. Every day I wake up, including the days that I've been in Australia for the first time, or the last number of days, I pinch myself. What it means to be free. The government wanted to take away my liberties and my freedoms. I was willing to give all that up so that others could remain free. That's what's at stake. That's really the heart of the matter here. And how dare any state or any power take away our individual sovereignty. We've made a lot of progress in terms of the uneven, the uneven progress of democracy. I, in terms of Western democracy, it, I can go back to the Magna Carta, you know, the, the so-called divine right of kings. So what do we do? We're going backwards. So we're gonna give up our rights as citizens to become subjects to and su subjects of the state? I don't think so. And that's ultimately about we the people. If we choose not to resist that, if we choose to look the other way, if we choose to act like nothing really is going on, then we deserve the government we keep. And we deserve the governments we get. I don't want to dampen your enthusiasm, Thomas, but uh, quietly last week the Attorney General here, George Brandis, introduced a national security legislation amendment bill um, I mean, what was really interesting to me was that how quiet the response was uh, to this. I mean, there was a lot of other things going on, of course, in the news last week. But their new laws, their proposals for new legislation that are going to beef up uh, ASIO's powers. It's currently under review, committee review. Uh, some of these powers include one warrant to assess multiple devices. Uh, including computers of third parties, new laws to allow closer collaboration with uh, ACES, Australia's Secret Intelligence Service, new laws for greater penalties for leakers of classified information, a uh, new offence which seems aimed at journalists uh, carrying up to 10 years jail for anyone who discloses inform information relating to a special intelligence operation. Um, all this, too, from an Attorney General who is uh, the biggest supporter of free speech we've ever known, because, of course, it's fine to go around being a bigot now. Oh, uh, yeah, but God yeah. help you if you actually were to um, reveal some truth, uh, I suppose, along the lines of what Edward Snowden has done. How does Australia sit in your... In your idealistic mind there, Thomas. <laughs> uh, Jessalyn, do you it's, first? It seems that law is so draconian and would be so chilling in terms of freedom of the press, it would criminalize a reporter talking to a source. In fact, I was at Splendor in the Grass, and um, your member of parliament, Steve Chobo, said unequivocally that if a journalist reported a story on the same revelations as the ones Edward Snowden had made, that they would be subject to prosecution under this law, which carries a 10-year jail sentence, as you noted, and would also put 
the source in trouble. It, it, it's the most draconian thing I have seen, and it is completely antithetical to a free and open democratic society. We also have a leader who's a supposed constitutional scholar who's doing some pretty dreadful things with our First Amendment. Um, but I find it very um, disturbing that Australia is entertaining this kind of legislation and that there hasn't been a greater outcry, especially from the press. Well, I, I don't think Fairfax um, even reported it the day it was announced. And the Australian, uh, it was a, a mixed response. Yeah, no civil or criminal liability if you are the security agency. I mean, I, this, is, this is extraordinary development in terms of democracy in Australia, that you actually propose legislation which exempts a domestic intelligence agency from the laws of the land. And if you dare, if you dare expose anything they're doing under the cover of national security, you might find yourself uh, in prison for many, many years. Mm -hmm. So what, you can criminalize you know, the revelations of government wrongdoing? It's even if you're an employee of ASIO, well, if it creates immunity for yeah. ATO, and, well, it, and it ends up looking like an official secrets act um, that, that you don't have in Australia and that we don't have in the United States. But measures like this, in effect, become an official secrets act by criminalizing journalism and criminalizing whistleblowing. And they are drafted, this particular um, proposed legislation is drafted so broadly that almost anything could be labeled a special intelligence operation, for example. Um, the definitions are so overbroad and vague um, as to make anyone subject to this. Yeah, it reminds me of my own case. I mean, I, I was told in no uncertain terms that I had severely damaged, gravely damaged, in fact, which is the highest form of damage in the national security of the United States, uh, that I had caused, uh, you know, I had endangered the lives of American soldiers. Uh, I was a traitor in a turncoat. I mean, this, this is going to send an extraordinary, if this passes uh, in, in its current form without huge changes, it's going to send a very chilling message. I will tell you, by virtue of this type of language, that it, it will create a climate in which people will self-censor. They will opt not to reveal anything. They'll opt not to associate with certain individuals. They'll opt not to share certain information just on the risk that it might be designated secret or it might be designated as something that would reveal you know, an intelligence operation. Well, in that, in that kind of a climate, guess what? Then it, it, has, it has its intended effect. If you would like to ask uh, one of our whistleblowers a question, put your hand up, and if someone puts a microphone in it, start talking. Uh, thanks very much for your talk uh, this evening. But um, unfortunately, in Australia at the moment, OZO is really doing all the damage and security and s surveillance that you're talking about in America. And uh, you've only got to... Uh, see what's happening with the uh, multinationals, how they're dominating the government, elected government of Australia, how everything's in a mess. And uh, unfortunately, I'm one of these people over the last 20 years, I'm 82 now, but uh, over the last 20 years, I've been uh, arguing against uh, privatisation and globalisation, and we can see now it is collapsing, and, uh, but people like me, you wouldn't believe it, an ordinary citizen with five children, uh, I've got a, an We're ASIO... We're going to need a question very soon because there are a lot of people. Yeah, I've, I've got a, a, an ASIO agent watching me all the time. It's incredible. And for a while, like two or three years ago, I was most distressed, but now I've become used to it. All right, I'm going to take that as a comment okay, and, and move you. on, but thank you. And I'm sorry you lost the globalisation war. That one didn't... didn't. <laughs> Next, thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, Ms Raddick and Mr Drake, thank you for talking about your experiences here and um, on other places like uh, Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman. I'd like to ask, ask you both um, what you thought the end game of all this was. Um, how many more years is Edward Snowden going to be in Russia? How many more years is Julian Assange going to be in uh, the London Ecuadorian Embassy? And um, the end game of the uh, security state, which Mr. Jake, you've called the a national religion uh, in America. Thank you. 
the end game, yeah, is uh, ultimately you will continue to see freedoms and liberties eroded for the sake of security. The end game is power and control. That's the end game. And if you want to take it to a more logical conclusion, then it's a plantation mentality. Uh, we all become uh, subjects. Uh, we're not citizens. And then the power is held by, by uh, the elite. The power is increasingly held by the, by the 1%. Is that really the kind of world we want to live in? I mean, I'm well aware of the dynamics by the earlier gentleman in terms of the multinational, the transnational dynamics here. This this goes beyond uh, you know sovereign states. It, it goes beyond um, who we are uh, as individual individuals, um, because this is where you get bought and sold, right, in secret and on the open market. There are real threats here, there's real concerns, and even security services themselves have become transnational nature. One of the jokes you would hear at NSA, and they're quite serious about it, pre presidents come and go, but we're still here. Even directors of NSA come and go, but we're still here. In terms of Edward Snowden, um, he would love nothing more than to be able to return home under the right circumstances, meaning not facing an Espionage Act trial in which he has no defense. There is no public interest defense when you're charged with espionage, no whistleblower defense, no overclassification defense. Um, but he would love to eventually be back, but for now, um, I see this more as a long distance run than a sprint and anticipate that he'll be staying in Russia, at least in the near term. Um, Way better call than Julian Assange, wasn't it? I'd take all of Russia before a little room in, a, in an embassy. There are a lot of people uh, who right now who are in this category of free but not free. Julian's free, but he's constrained to the embassy. And Snowden is free, but he is constrained to being in Moscow right now. Um, Sarah Harrison is free, but risks a terrorism prosecution if she tries to return home to the UK. And so she is exiled um, in Germany right now. We have created an entire class of people who are theoretically free, but are quite constrained. And I think that's a, a horrible path to be on. Am I right that Edward Snowden has said that if uh, the United States offered him a trial with a jury, that he would happily come home and face it? I think if he had a trial with a jury and an opportunity to present a defense, that would be something he would seriously consider. But the way the Espionage Act works, when Tom went through the same thing, your motive as a whistleblower is completely irrelevant. So whether you wanted to sell secrets to spies for economic gain, or whether you wanted to give information back to your fellow citizens so they can make informed decisions, doesn't matter. And you don't have a chance to explain that to the judge. Um, it is a strict liability offense. And there's no opportunity for your salutary motives to come into play or for you to make your case for all those people who say, oh, Snowden should face the music and make his case and man up. Well, if he had an opportunity to really do that, I think he would. Look, the reality for me is I'm the only person who was criminally investigated, who was prosecuted, charged, indicted, and convicted for surveillance, and I, all I did was expose it. John Kiriakou, the only person in prison because he exposed torture and had nothing to do with the torture program. So you have Edward Snowden, who's disclosing how far the surveillance apparatus has metastasized over the last decade plus. He had to leave the country, had any hope of getting this information into the hands of journalists. You had Chelsea Manning, who exposed the extraordinary follies of American foreign policy and the, tra and the tragedy that ensued, and, and, all, and all that we have, have, have caused as a result of those foreign policy uh, misadventures. And where, what does he end up? 35 years uh, at Fort, Fort Leavenworth. I'm well aware of the extraordinarily high cost that these people and we pay for standing up against power. And power wants to break you. Power wants to, to ensure that uh, you are punished severely. Um, the question is, is what is society at large going to do? That's the question. Hi. Um, thanks for speaking with us. 
Um, during the discussion, well, during the talk, both of you referred to the sort of constitutional safeguards that were involved. There was discussion about the United States freeing itself of the shackles of the Constitution or discussion about the Fourth Amendment. Um, for people that reside in countries that are, do not have that strong uh, positive rights background in their law and for whom many of the sort of apparatus of surveillance and collection are centred offshore, for example, you know, there's no Australian Facebook, there's no Australian Google yet. Uh, what advice would you give to people who uh, are in that position, I suppose? Well, I understand the Bill of Rights uh, because we're not using the United States, uh, you know, is at least stuff for sale. Maybe you can get it for pennies on the dollar. Uh, okay. Uh, see. You know, it, it is, it, I mean, it's an extraordinary document for all of its faults and foibles, and you're right. That means that it's, it's even more dangerous in democracies that don't have a Bill of Rights which ensures that the citizens are protected against their own government. So in our own country, you know, the government unchained itself. Well, what about, you know, here in Australia, you don't have a Bill of Rights, so what's your protection? Well, then what does that tell you? If the government can pass legislation, right, that effectively erodes even further your own sovereignty as citizens, well, you know, once you lose your freedoms and your liberties, it's really hard to get them back. Well, I think even if you don't have a constitution, in a democracy, in a democratic form of government, the people are supposed to control the government, not the other way around. And you have yourselves, and you have your own ability to make noise about this. Um, I'm frankly surprised. I, I mean, frankly, to me, people should be marching in the streets over Snowden's revelations. But unfortunately, we live in a different period of time than we did when Dan Ellsberg, for example, in America revealed the Pentagon Papers, which are widely credited with helping to end the Vietnam War and the Nixon era. It was a very different time. But populist outrage can go a long way. And one of the biggest battles I feel I fight every day is against apathy and against people saying, well, it, it doesn't affect me, or um, I have nothing to hide, I have nothing to fear, um, or the government can't possibly be interested in me. I'm not doing anything that interesting. Um, to me, that sidesteps the problem, and I think you have a lot more power than you realize um, in any form of representative democracy. But I recognize the challenge that people face. I mean, I had many, many colleagues who will not see me. In fact, there's no one right now that has any regular contact with me from where I used to work. And they actually say why. Some of them are quite honest about it. It says, oh, I have a job, I don't want to lose my job. I have retirement, I don't want to jeopardize it. Uh, I have a mortgage and I have kids in college. So for them, their own personal security takes priority over whether or not they're actually losing their, their freedoms and liberties at the, at the larger level. So the fact that I ended up doing what I did says, well, yeah, why would I do what you did? Because get, look what price you paid. But then what kind of price you put on liberty and freedom? It really does matter. I mean, I, it just comes back to who we are. And you know, it's, it's our call. In the end, it's our choice. And uh, I keep telling people, you can blame the government and, and blame others and point fingers. Well, then what are you going to do about it tomorrow? You know, if you're informed, you have knowledge. And you can put that knowledge into action. Uh, hello, I'm right down the back. <laughs> Just I wait so you can there. see it. <laughs> I want to say thank you to Res, uh, Jessalyn and Thomas for what you've sacrificed and what you've done, and also uh, no Jeremy Hammond and Barrett Brown and Aaron Schwartz, who also paid very largely for trying to uh, make information free. Uh, in Australia, we are integrated into the American military machinery and surveillance state to such an extent, uh, it's very difficult sometimes to understand how we can unlink ourselves, uh, particularly with such facilities as Pine Gap. I'm one of the people that did campaign for Bradley Manning and Julian Assange, and that's brought a lot of attention from federal authorities onto myself and has created hardship in all sorts of ways. So my question to you is, has there been any successful campaigning around this in America and what lessons can we learn about detaching ourselves from such a huge octopus machinery that seems to have infiltrated Australian politics, military and surveillance? <laughs> yeah, you're painting Australia as a client state of the United States. 
Well, you want to continue to live as a client state? Go ahead. Be my guest. I mean, it's, I don't think that's in your long-term interest. I think Australia, in many respects, is uniquely positioned, particularly in this part of the world, to become far more independent. But the question is, will they actually make that break? I've, I actually put this, I put this question even to Germany. Germany is uniquely positioned in terms of its own history, but will it break away from the American empire? You have to remember you're dealing with an American empire, and it's not going to let go of its client-state relationships very, very easily. Just not. So the question is, you know, are there enough, do you have enough of a significant minority that's willing to, willing to stand up and make a difference? It's certainly worth the effort. I, you know, I keep telling it's independence everywhere as, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but, I mean, Pine Gap, yeah, I'm well aware, you know, Echelon, the Five Eyes community, extraordinarily powerful. It's existed for many, many decades, and it's become even stronger since 9-11. And they're not going to, that power is not going to yield itself very willingly, and it increasingly hides itself behind, behind the, the mantle of national security to conduct its, its, its affairs in secret. Hi. Um, it seems though there's a broader framework issue here. Um, in the American legal system, you've got privacy protections primarily through the Fourth Amendment. But my observation is that American privacy laws are very weak. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission has recently complained about mass data broking, uh, where you know, data of individuals has been uh, handed around and, and provided uh, with very little restrictions. And it seems that this has been a continual problem in America that uh, uh, whilst you might have uh, Fourth Amendment rights, general privacy protections in statute and in common law is quite weak. And to an extent, you've set a framework of weak privacy protections and there's an element of you've made your bed and there's an element of lying in it here. Now, I'm an optimist, so I would like to think that it's possible to reverse a problem if you were the legislature of two, what would you do? How would you institute some form of privacy protections, notwithstanding the fact that your First Amendment rights um, give Trump privacy protections uh, under your constitution? So if you're, you're now the Congress, mm -hmm. what laws would you implement to remedy the problem? Not just on whistleblowing, but I'm talking about general privacy protections in the United States. The USA Freedom Act, uh, I, I think I would dismantle NSA or at least withdraw funding for it as Representative Amash suggested doing and nearly got that bill passed in the House. Um, I think I would end uh, the 215 bulk surveillance collection completely, kill it. Um, I don't think it'll stand up constitutionally in the courts. Um, on the, in terms of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which is really this small little enclave of judges who rubber stamp warrants and I think have rejected three in, in its entire history, I would make sure there was an advocate for the other side because right now that so-called court only hears the government side and routinely approves every government warrant. So there are a number of legislative reforms that could help. Um, I think strengthening whistleblower protections would also help in terms of having an affirmative whistleblower, an affirmative public interest defense. Um, right now we have whistleblower laws that sound good in theory, but number one, they don't cover national security and intelligence whistleblowers. And number two, when you get retaliated against, even if you're in another category of whistleblower who's covered, there's no independent cause of action for you to bring against the government for their retaliation. For me, you actually have to have an independent investigation of all of this. Uh, it's gone way too far. You actually have a secret government uh, not beholden to the Constitution. It's arisen from in the United States, and they don't care. There is no rule of law. It's whatever they can get away with. It's the Catch-22. It's a Joseph Heller novel. We have the power now. Who's going to stop us? So legislation by itself is insufficient. Uh, first, you've got to expose all the wrongdoing and all of the uh, criminality first. Um, you know, all this emphasis on whistleblowers and truth tellers. Remember, we're just symptomatic of, what, of the conduct of government gone, gone uh, rogue. It's pretty incredible to me that there is not a single investigation of the NSA 
in the US. I mean, at a minimum, Congress should have appointed a special prosecutor or independent counsel um, from the Justice Department to investigate NSA. In fact, I think the only such investigation going on right now is the one being conducted in Germany um, by, by the Bundestag. Bundestag, um, that investigation, and even that apparently is being spied on by the U.S. So the U.S. is spying on an investigation of the U.S. spying on Germans. <laughs> Last uh, question at the front. Um, we'd all like to fight against apathy, but in Australia, most of us can't be bothered, you know? <laughs> You know, I do have hope, though. I know it's interesting. I, I, I had a number of conversations. Uh, I really do. I think you are uniquely positioned. There is this air reverency. You have this wry, wry sense of humor. Uh, it's even biting. Uh, you don't take authority too seriously. This cue that's on my lapel is question everything, especially authority. I think this air reverency uh, may actually be your saving grace. At least I hope it is. Uh, down under, as we say, above the equator. Not, not taking authority too seriously would yeah. be a bit of a problem, though, with that, wouldn't it? Because yeah. this is all about taking Actually, authority it is. seriously. But look, yeah. as bad as it is, um, wouldn't you rather uh, the Western uh, approach to things than, uh, than, for example, Russia or uh, you know, things that are going on in the Middle East uh, and that sort of thing? Yeah, but why engage in some of the same kind of tyrannical or dictatorial powers even behind the scenes? It's, un, it's not necessary. We don't, have to, we don't have to go down that path. And somehow we, we under this, history's not kind, under this illusion that we'll be able to keep our, our democratic practice and principles, we won't. No, we love democracy. We'd like to keep it that way. I just want, I just want my constitution again. I want, to, I want to get back to 910. Yeah, that's for me personally. Fascinating conversation, and uh, I'm sorry that our time is already up. Um, for those of you that are interested uh, in the Guardian podcast, it is on our website. This will also be up uh, probably by tomorrow, so uh, if you've got friends or anybody else that wants to listen, uh, you can have a look. Please thank our uh, fabulous, fabulous whistleblowers, Jessalyn Raddick and Thomas Drake. It's uh, really, really lovely to have you here and free and well and <laughs> smiling. Um, just a, uh, another little notice too that this is the last fifth estate for this program, program two. Um, it will resume in, I think, four weeks after the Melbourne Writers' Festival. But there are a couple of special fifth estates at the Writers' Festival. So you can have a look on the Wheeler site or the Melbourne Writers' Festival site for that. And uh, we'll be back with our third program uh, with Wayne Swan is the opening act. So I look forward to seeing uh, some of you then and thank you very, very much for coming tonight. Have a great night.